Right, welcome everybody. Um, if anyone's listening, um, it would be good if you could just type in the chat window that you can hear me okay. Otherwise, we'll start with a brief introduction as to who I am. Thanks, Anne. Appreciate it. Um, my name's Dave Norris, um, so no Chuck Norris jokes allowed. Uh, I'm a developer advocate based in Sydney, Australia. And I'm going to spend the next 50 minutes or so walking you through specifically how MuleSoft can help you design, build, and secure APIs across any environment. So in terms of housekeeping, I see Janet and Anne are on the chat window already. Um, if you have any questions as I go through, feel free to use the chat box. I'll endeavor to check it from time to time to answer any questions. But if, I, if I'm not getting around to it straight away, know that there's plenty of time at the end for me to, to answer any questions you have. So in terms of format, I'm going to keep it as engaging as possible. Um, but I am going to use some slides just to anchor the conversation. The first slide I need to go through are forward-looking statements, just to say any forward-looking statements I might make during this presentation, don't make any purchasing decisions based on it, just on what's generally available. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to guide you through the platform with a little bit of a story just to help bring to life some of the concepts and features I'm going to show. So I'm going to use Northern Trail Outfitters, which is a fictitious retail company. And one of the new features they've recently introduced is the ability to do a one-click checkout from their website. So that allows registered users to log in and buy something with one click, just like me and you do uh, on popular retail websites. So the reason I want to show this to you is just to explain the customer experience that it's going to give someone like Rachel Morris in this case. So Rachel's been in lockdown, if, you, if you're living in Australia, for several months now. And Rachel is an outdoors person. And she really wants to plan a camping trip with friends as soon as she's able to. So Rachel's going to log on to NTO's website where she's shopped before. She's going to locate a venture jacket that she likes. And she'll use the new one-click checkout feature. So if there's a problem and the shipping notification gets sent and it's going to arrive after she's expecting to leave, then typically Rachel would call the contact center. Now, NTO systems are connected and the customer service rep on the other end of the phone can see Rachel's full profile, including the last purchase order she's made. And by giving the contact center rep visibility into Rachel's profile, they can offer expedited shipping at no cost. So this, what I'm describing now is really the experience we all expect from the companies we do business with. So if, if we all want similar experiences and every company we do business with know it, why isn't everyone doing it? And typically it's because building those connected experiences is, is super hard. So if we take a step back at the moment and just have a think about what a place order one-click checkout might look like, we have to get IT teams to look at how they're going to integrate with order management systems. And they're going to have to pull information out of um, CRM systems like Salesforce for contact information. They're going to have to deal with inventory and availability information, and let alone dealing with payment processing and shipping updates. And their technical requirements, but also then layer on top of that, the business business objectives where you have competitors that are doing similar things, project deadlines and security, and an overarching API strategy that NTO probably needs to adhere to. So I could cut this, this PowerPoint very short by saying what I'm going to show you is really proving out MuleSoft's point of view on API delivery, which is make it easy for developers to build and deploy, make it easy to secure those APIs, make sure that they're resilient and they can scale vertically and horizontally, and make sure that you can change stuff whenever you want to. So fundamentally as goals, these are the pillars that features I'm going to show you can be tied back to. So to make it a little bit more engaging than me just showing PowerPoints, what I'm going to do is go through a persona and for each persona, describe and show you what the experience of managing an API looks like from that person's perspective. 
So I'm going to start with developers. So their job is to design and build both the API specifications and the implementation behind it. And I'll tie it back to Rachel Morris's consumer experience by saying that if you imagine the contact center rep being able to see Rachel's orders, or well, fundamentally to be able to do that, I need to connect their CRM system with the order management system. So I need the ability to, to get orders and I need the ability to push orders into OMS. So this is where we're going to meet Melinda. Melinda's my persona for a MuleSoft developer. She works in IT. And she knows that the OMS is built on a Postgres database. And it's difficult to access without the appropriate domain knowledge. So she decides she's going to implement a REST API on top of the database. The idea behind this is she'll simplify finding and accessing order data for other developers. So this becomes a key piece of the jigsaw in building out that one click um, purchase button on the website. So Melinda's going to take a API design first approach and look at the API specification. So let's see how Melinda might do that. So if I switch over to a MuleSoft page, this is really the anchor page where by showing you a little bit of the, a customer experience, I can tie it into features a little bit more easily because we're not going to show them all. But when Melinda logs into MuleSoft, she will start by using the design center. So you can see here, this is really where I'm going to create Mule APIs. And this is what it looks like. Melinda's going to create a new API specification. She's creating the order API. And whilst Melinda can directly create the specification, she actually needs a little bit more guidance. So she's going to use a, a visual interface to help scaffold that API specification for her. So Melinda is going to start in the wizard just by specifying the, the name of her API. And then she's going to go ahead and start looking at what data types are going to be returned or expected to be sent to this API. So for sure, it's an order API. So we're going to have a data type, which is going to be an object. And it's going to be of the order type. Now, what she can do is she can type in the property she's expecting by hitting add property. And she might say, well, an order for sure is going to have an order ID and it's going to be a number. And it's probably going to have something like a status. There's going to be a string. And at the bottom, it's building out an example of what the, the specification, what the JSON is going to look like. Or I can just go ahead and edit this directly and paste in an example of what I'm expecting to receive when I call this orders API. So Melinda carries on building out these properties, and then she's going to have to eventually add resources. So we can add an order resource. And here are all the resources we have available. I'm on the get resource at the moment. I can say this will be called get orders. And I'm expecting some responses. If someone calls this get order request, it needs to return 200 status OK. And if I wanted to, I could even say I'm expecting it to look like the data type I've just created. So what I'm demonstrating here, you'll notice on the right-hand side, what it's doing is it's actually building the API specification for me. And it's not just in the REST API markup language or RAML, but it's also in the open API specification as well. So this is great for Melinda because she didn't have to write this, handcraft it herself. She could have a guided response and then she could go and edit it directly if she felt comfortable. So Melinda can then publish this. She's going to publish it to something called Exchange. And what any point exchange is, is really a hub where developers are going to share reusable assets. Now, we've just shared a REST API asset called the order API. 
So this is what's available internally at NTO. And it's a key part of MuleSoft's point of view on how you make APIs reusable is you have to expose them to your audience so that they can give you feedback, comment, and find them in order to reuse them, in this case, in the one-click checkout. And it's not just stuff internally at NTO. There are assets provided by MuleSoft. So you can see here, there is a connector to Salesforce. So Melinda knows that that's going to be a key part of the design here, because eventually we're going to need to be able to accept orders from Salesforce. But there are other ways to connect to things like Amazon S3, Twilio, MongoDB. So these are the data connections that we're going to be using to build out the implementation. And note that it's not just connectors. It's things also like API spec fragments. So where I created an order data type, there are best practices around perhaps the cloud information model on what a person should be modeled as. And MuleSoft's already given me a starting point that I can use in my API specifications if I want to. So if we go back and look at the order API we've published, what Melinda can do is add a description. She can add images, videos to describe what this API should do. Uh, and people in NTO can then comment, review, and suggest improvements. There is the ability immediately to see the two resources I created. So get order with the examples from the API specification and included code fragments of how I would call this API from JavaScript or Python. And most importantly, if someone found this API in NTO and they wanted to see what it did, there is a mocking service endpoint created for Melinda. So if I send a request to this mocking service endpoint, I get a 200 OK response with the example data I included in the specification. So this is important because people can A, try it, but B, you start using it straight away without me having implemented anything yet, because remember, this isn't actual data from the OMS Postgres database. It's just the sample data from the specification. OK, so all we've done so far is created the API spec. We haven't done anything with the implementation. So to actually implement this, I need to switch to a tool called AnyPoint Studio. So anyone that's done any Java development will be probably intimately familiar with the Eclipse IDE. And MuleSoft has plugins available to, for me to create a Mule project. In this case, Melinda's creating an NTO order project. And what I can do is I can import a published API directly from Exchange. So because I've published the order API, I should be able to search for it. And add it to my project. Now, this is saving Melinda a lot of time because what AnyPoint Studio is going to do is scaffold everything I need to implement the logic behind what the get order API needs to do. So already I have an HTTP listener and I have two resources added for put and get. And you'll notice that this is very visual. I don't have to understand Java code to be able to do this. So what Melinda's going to do is add logic to the put and get methods to actually query the OMS database. So to save a bit of time, I did this earlier, but just added one more step. So what you'll see on the right-hand side is an important step is you can see the same assets I just showed you in any point exchange in a palette ready for Melinda to use. So Melinda needs to query a database, a Postgres database. So there's a database connector. And here are the methods available to Melinda. So Melinda could drag in the select method. Then if I highlight the select method, all Melinda needed to do was specify where the Postgres database was, in this case, on AWS, and the authentication credentials. Then I needed to specify a query. So in the Postgres database, I have a customers and orders table that I'm joining together. 
to generate the output. And then what I need to do is transform the output of the query into something that I promised to give back to clients calling my API. And at the moment, um, it's, it's not doing that. It's showing me what my API specification says I should be returning. And it's showing me here what the database is sending me, but there's nothing in between. I'm not doing the transformation. So one of the value propositions of AnyPoint Studio is I'm not writing code to do this. I'm going to be using a language called DataWeave. So what I'll do is I'll just expand this slightly, make it a bit easier to see. And I'm going to put on a preview. So what happens is Melinda can just simply drag um, stuff from the left-hand side coming out of the database to the right-hand side, which is my order API specification of what I promised to return. And what Data Weave is going to do is specify the necessary expressions to do the transformation for me. And you can see in the bottom, it's actually building out the response that's going to be sent based on, based on what I'm dragging. So I'll do a few more. We'll do order ID and status. So if you think about productivity here, this is a lifesaver for people like Melinda because anyone that's tried to transform JSON or convert JSON to XML, it's a very time consuming process involving a lot of boilerplate code. Whereas in DataWeave, sure whereas in DataWeave, it's 10 lines of code to transform from A to B. And because there are functions available, I can do things like perhaps I don't want all records in the response. I can filter some out. So I might say filter by email, which is something coming in from the database. And I can say only where email contains Lexus. And then immediately it filters out anything where there's not a Lexus in the email address. So I can do things like group by, order by, filter. Um, the other thing that I found useful is the ability to convert XML to JSON, because you can tell here that um, just by simply specifying, um, simply specifying the output, I can change the format. The other important thing is um, I can also debug this. Because when we say you can run MuleSoft anywhere, you'll see on the left-hand side that really, to all intents and purposes, what I've just done is created a Java application. And it uses Maven and a POM file to specify all of the dependencies, which are my connectors from, from the exchange. And it goes ahead and compiles that. And it can run that lightweight Java application called the Mule Runtime to host my application anywhere I can have a JVM, including my local PC. So this is important because I can add things like, as, a, as Melinda needs to debug it, she can add breakpoints. And I'll wait for this to be built and see if we can call it so you can see the outputs. So whilst that's running, I'll switch to Postman. And in order to test that, I can just call a local host on port 8081, since I haven't implemented TLS yet on this API, and call the endpoint that I want to test. So that looks like it's running. I'll just check it's been deployed successfully. So if we navigate back to Postman and I call this, What's going to happen is Postman's going to freeze because what's actually happened is it's gone to the get order resource and it's highlighted my select statement from the Postgres database. And you can see it's gone to a debug perspective in the Eclipse Studio. I don't have any payload yet. Um, but what I can do is start stepping into the order API to see what's next. Let me just minimize this.
So if I could find where the next statement was, I could I could tab into the transform message and see the payload change. So for Melinda as well, when you're debugging these um, applications, it's easy to do that locally before you deploy it. All right, so if I switch back to the design perspective, all Melinda needs to do as the final step is right click on her tested deployed API, sorry, her tested API and deploy it, which you can do by deploying to the AnyPoint platform and deploy to Cloud Hub. So this takes it from her local machine and will now deploy it to an instance managed by MuleSoft. But because you've seen that it can run in any JVM, it's easy to run this on your own infrastructure if you choose, in hybrid infrastructure, or in a cloud service provider that you have. So what we've just seen from Melinda is the Visual API Designer. We saw App Exchange with the documentation available. Um, we saw how we can use the App Exchange connectors to help us build those flows visually and using data weave to do the transformations and accessing those data points much more easily than writing um, a perhaps a node script or Python. So what about now we've deployed it? In this case, we've deployed it using Cloud Hub, but it could be on premise or on AWS. How do we govern those APIs and secure them? So for this, I've picked Bruce as my persona. So Bruce is the API owner from NTO, and it's his responsibility to make sure that you need credentials to access the orders API. So what Bruce can do is use a feature called API Manager. And Bruce can navigate to the one of the APIs he's responsible for and configure policies. So you can see we have we now have a deployed API. So it's no longer local host, it's actually deployed somewhere, in this case, the Cloud Hub. And Bruce doesn't have any policies on this yet. So in theory, it does mean that if I call that same API endpoint, then I should get a response from my Postgres database, which I do. So these are two real records being retrieved from the OMS. But Bruce wanted to secure that and make sure that um, he enforces client ID. So Bruce has lots of things available to him. So he might want to put in some rate limiting controls on the order API or some spike control. Uh, he might want to do something around security in terms of allowing or blocking IP address ranges. In our case, we're just going to enforce client IDs. And just by applying that, what's going to happen now is the next time I call this endpoint, it's going to make sure I have a client ID and a client secret. And the way other developers get access to this API is simply by requesting it from the exchange. So if we go back to the order API, this is where the other developers were finding what Melinda was doing. Um, I have the ability to request access to this API. So I can say I want access to NTO orders and I can create a new application. So we know Service Cloud is gonna need access to this from Salesforce. I can create my application and request access. So the Salesforce developers now have a client ID and client secret that they can use to start implementing an API to get orders from OMS. What Bruce can also do, as well as applying policies at the API level, he can view the contracts associated with his APIs. So you can see we've just created an application called Service Cloud, and Bruce can choose to revoke access at any time. We set this to auto approve, but you can also set an approval process where Bruce would have to go in and approve this before they got any credentials. And if Bruce wanted to, he could also set up automated policies that apply to all the APIs he manages um, simply by going to automated policies. So any new API would have these policies enforced by default. 
So if I go back to Postman and I try and send a request, I'm now going to get authentication denied. But if I include a client ID and client secret from a application that's requested access, then we go back to now being able to access the OMS database. So again, using those personas, it helps me tie back to really what we're trying to do here is not just build quickly, but also enforce those out of the box API policies. Super simple to do. And built in contract management gives Bruce insight into who requested access and the ability to revoke it. Which brings me on to our third persona. So Melinda built, designed and built and deployed. Bruce then went in and ensured there was some sort of security measures on the API. Now we'll look at DevOps uh, who typically manage those deployments and look and troubleshoot and fix issues and look about look at things like scaling vertically and horizontally. So I've got the persona here, Roxy who works in NTO IT ops teams. Um, and she really needs the full view and how all of these different APIs talk to each other. And she needs really to anticipate and fix issues with the shopping experience apps if that's her remit. So it's not just going to be the order API, it's going to be anything related to the order API. So let's have a look at the AnyPoint platform from Roxy's perspective. So when Roxy logs in, Roxy's got access to things like Runtime Manager, where she can manage and monitor deployed apps. AnyPoint Monitoring, where she can monitor and set up alerts. And Visualizer, where she's going to visualize what MuleSoft calls an application network, but it's really how the APIs are using one another. So if I show you what that looks like, this is Runtime Manager. And I can look at for a currently deployed NTO order API. And what Roxy can do is have a look at the settings of when Melinda deployed it, what size did Melinda allocate to this application? And we also have talks in, in the form of V cores, but these are really virtual machines and I'm allocating CPU and memory to them. So the bigger the vCore, the more memory and CPU. So Roxy can decide whether that's enough or whether she needs to add more or less. And workers, that's really scaling vertically, the way I think about that. Or she can decide to increase the number of workers. So this is how many of that type of application are running. So really, if I was Roxy, Roxy would want at least two here because deploying to Cloud Hub, MuleSoft would auto automatically allocate those two workers across two different availability zones within the Cloud Hub infrastructure on AWS. And Roxy has the ability to auto scale here. So based on CPU thresholds, she might be seeing, based on memory usage, she might be seeing, she can say when it reaches a threshold, automatically increase worker size or automatically increase or decrease number of workers. The other thing Roxy can do is start getting insight into analytics. So Roxy can have a look at how the order API is performing. If she clicks on the performance lens, then she will start to see over time how many messages are being sent to this endpoint and things like the average response time and even response time broken down by endpoint. And we talked about the ability to auto scale. Well, that's going to require her to get an insight into the underlying infrastructure. Since we know a Mule app is deployed to a JVM, I need to be able to see the CPU utilization uh, and memory utilization so that I can see peaks and troughs. And I can see if at certain times of the day, maybe I need to um, enable auto scaling. And then I need to decide if that's a vertical scale or a horizontal scale. But Roxy can configure it all from this view in Runtime Manager and AnyPoint Monitoring. 
But the important thing is to understand that it's not just the technical stats that Roxy's interested in. It's also providing the business with some insights into how the orders API is moving the bottom line. Uh, and to do that, you can create a custom dashboard in any point monitoring. And when Melinda implemented the flow, Melinda could have chosen to send statistics like what's the revenue, what's the total amount that's being sent with every API call? Because Melinda would have that information in the specification from perhaps a put request to the OMS system, she would know what the list price was. So she could total that up and send it to the AnyPoint monitoring um, system. So now NTO can start tracking, well, what's the change to the bottom line? What's the total number of orders we've done this year? How many orders have we processed? How many products have we sold? And she can even do that by channel if she wanted to see website versus mobile. So that's super powerful. One more thing I need to show you. We talked about the importance of seeing the application network, which is really how the APIs are connecting together. That's super difficult to do from a list view. So we also have a feature called AnyPoint Visualizer. Now, what this is doing is basically showing you a view, a lens on how the APIs are all tied together. So I can see where the order API fits into a much bigger picture for the commerce APIs. So this is useful in itself, but perhaps Roxy wants to get an insight into what security mechanisms we have in place for each API. So we talked about Bruce's role of adding those security policies. Well, Roxy can get confirmation here that the order API has four API level policies, including client ID enforcement enabled on that API. So Roxy and Bruce can now start getting an overview of are they consistently applying security policies across their network? But Roxy's real role is to troubleshoot is issues. So the other lens on this network is what's taking a long time and what's failing. And it shows me um, on a nice view here, the heat map. And I'm currently looking at failure rate, which APIs are failing. So I can immediately see as Roxy that the customer notification API has 87% failure rate. But I can also view it through average response time or average CPU utilization and change date ranges. So if Roxy wants to investigate this to reduce time to resolution, she can highlight it to get some key stats. Like I know there's been 23 requests and 20 of them have failed, but Roxy can actually drill into the individual logs. So straight from Visualizer, I can open up a, a any point monitoring and it will filter to that specific API. And then I can further filter on the log level to perhaps only show me errors. And then further to that, I can then drill in into a specific point in time. So this is giving me the actual failure message. I'm getting a fail too many requests 429 from this API and give that to Melinda that maybe we need some spike control. Maybe we need some to monitor the rates at which things are being sent to this API to help hopefully resolve this faster. So as Roxy, what I've just shown you is managing what's been deployed and what's been secured from that single UI. So we looked at visualizer and any point monitoring. We could visualize all of the APIs within the commerce um, APIs that Roxy manages and we get technical insights into performance and infrastructure, but also business insights into what this means for the bottom line for NTO. And the other thing you can do is set up alerting and functional monitors. So perhaps I'll show you that quickly. So if I go back to the custom dashboard, one of the things on here would be average response time by endpoint. So 
right now, this is a very reactive point of view. Roxy needs to log in and actually look at these graphs to have any insights and to take action. But Roxy can choose to add an alert, in this case to say, if the average response time inbound is above six seconds in the past five minutes, then automatically notify someone in NTO. So it moves the conversation from being reactive to proactive. Okay, so the last persona is the integration architect um, who's really looking to adapt new technologies and develop the API strategy at NTO. So this is Jack. Jack's a senior architect with NTO and the scenario I've come up with here is imagine that Jack wants to upgrade the OMS database from Postgres to maybe a commercial off the shelf offering, um, maybe a SaaS provider. So currently at NTO, the current state of the application network that we could visualize in any point visualizer is we have some APIs, including the one we've just deployed, order API, to access key data sources. So we've got CRM data for customer, OMS gives us the order information, and maybe we have a product information management system for products. Now, what we need to do at MuleSoft is we sort of recommend looking at if you ever need to orchestrate across these APIs to deliver a business process, then to create a new API in a process API layer, which is a conceptual term to say, in order to fulfill an order, I will need customer information, I will need to query orders, and I will also need to get product information. So that is all gonna be done in the process API called order fulfillment. And then at MuleSoft, in order to separate out a level of abstraction, again, principle, um, the principle that you should abstract everything to make sure it can fail on its own, then you can have experienced APIs as well, because the mobile API is going to want a different format, potentially different fields from customers and orders than, the, than the perhaps a, a desktop. It might even be a different format. One might be JSON, one might be XML. So if Jack wanted to replace the OMS, taking this approach makes the project slightly more feasible because we've already published the order API specification that Melinda designed. As long as the contract doesn't change of what we're sending back to the clients, I only need to change the order API in order to absorb another data source. In this case, not Postgres, but a SaaS OMS. And in the future, if NTO wanted to perhaps um, enable the one-click order for things like the partner portal, then that becomes a lot more easy because I don't have to reinvent the customer order and product infrastructure to do that. I just need to decide what format the partner portal needs it in. So a new experience API. And likely if you wanted the kiosk experience in the retail stores at NTO, that's not going to be too much re uh, rework either. So to recap, since NTO uses that API-led architecture, they're more easily able to adopt disruptive technology and make changes to their enterprise architect landscape. And they can maximize reuse of the existing assets because they're publishing them to exchange and making them available for other lines of business to find and reuse. And the important thing here is we showed you Exchange from the point of view internally at NTO, but you do have the options to make those APIs available externally as well. And you don't have to deploy your APIs to Cloud Hub, which is what I've shown you here, but we've talked about it being easily portable to public cloud hybrid or on-premise implementations as well. So there's a lot of flexibility. Which brings me on to Datagraph because there's one thing that we're seeing in the market is the API-led approach uh, can mean that I can oversubscribe fields from a request to an API, or I need to make multiple requests across APIs to fulfill a need. So if you have a, 
a need like a mobile application that needs to only retrieve a really small subset of orders or products or customers, then customers are looking to move towards GraphQL implementations where one endpoint can, can mean that multiple developers can request just the information they need. So I'll try and put that into context in terms of MuleSoft. So what ideally people want to do conceptually is convert a REST API specification that they've created in, in OAS or RAML. So I've got the example here of an order API because that's what we created. And they want to create a GraphQL schema from that. So from the specification, can I automatically create a schema that represents orders and products and make them available as an endpoint? Because historically, what I've had to do is request the order data, and it's going to give me everything that I specified in the API specification. So we know the order ID, date, and status, and any other fields. So if the client was requesting this information but only wanted two of those fields, then oh. tough luck. You're going to have to take three and just ignore one of them. So what GraphQL's job is to do is to take an HTTP request and turn it into a query. And ideally, query across multiple APIs. So GraphQL has the concept of resolvers that if I'm querying orders and products and they're different APIs, it should automatically facilitate calling the different APIs to give me back the response I need. So that's what any point data graph in MuleSoft is designed to do. It's going to take multiple APIs and combine them into a data service that I can then consume, and I can consume many APIs in a single request. So any point data graph is really a visual tool to help you do that. So it can replace custom code from any API requests with a managed service. Again, I'm using things like uh, any point API manager to manage the governance around these to deliver new experiences. And I'll show you what I mean by that. It's a little bit easier if I show you. So if I was to log in, um, as someone that's looking to implement GraphQL, I can use AnyPoint Data Graph. And AnyPoint Data Graph allows me to add any API in Exchange that I've published. So in this case, I have two orders and products. Once I've gone through the process of specifying the order and the product APIs to add, what Data Graph does is it simply interrogates the API specification to extract a schema for orders and the fields that are available. And these are the properties in the RAML specification. So an order has order ID, order date, and status. And product is served by a completely different API. And it has different fields. It has product ID, list price, name, it has quantity, it has the SKU. But what a data graph allows me to do is it allows me to link products back to orders. So if we have a look at the product API and we look at the API schema, what you can see is you can see that the object, the fields, and then data graph gives me the ability to link this to another type. So in this case, I've said I'm on the product, but I want to link it to an order. And I have a foreign key on product. I have a field that's related to order called order ID. And I want to link it to a field called order ID on the parent object. So by linking the two together, I can now execute a query that goes across products and orders across two APIs with one call. And I can op optionally, if I have two APIs that return similar amounts of data, I can merge those two APIs together into one schema. So what this actually looks like, if you go back to the overarching schema, I can now run a GraphQL query. 
So I could do products, and we know products have a skew. And I can run this query. And if I trace the query, what you'll see is Datagraph automatically recognizing that products relies on the products API and calling that and retrieving the field SKU and displaying it in the response. But that doesn't mean I can't display other things. So if the developer suddenly says, for my mobile experience, I'm going to need the list price and I'm going to need the name, then I can run the same query across the same API and retrieve different results. But I haven't had to create multiple experience or process APIs to do this. Now, because I linked two objects together, I linked products and orders together, I shouldn't just be able to query the products API. I should, with one query, be able to get order information. So the IntelliSense helps me here because I know I've got three fields on order. I can, I can look at the date. I can look at the status. And I can look at the order ID. So if I run this, now I've got information back in one response that came from products and orders. And as a developer, it's great because if I decide order IP and status is just going to bloat the response, and I'm developing a mobile app, and I want the smallest response possible because I'm dealing with network latency, then anything that isn't going to fundamentally displayed in the UI, I can strip out. And I can see just the list price and the last order that Rachel Morris made for our hiking jacket. And what you can see behind the scenes, what Datagraph's done is simply created a, an endpoint for accessing that graph with some authentication credentials and a query that I can copy if I wanted to. So I've been using the Datagraph user interface to execute these queries, but I should just be able to go into Postman, take the same endpoint, um, take the same the same body, and Postman now supports GraphQL bodies, um, and send this in and get a very similar response. So this is more closely mim mimicking what a client would look like. And again, order as an order ID, which I can now retrieve from a client. So long and short of it, for MuleSoft customers looking to adopt GraphQL as a way of mitigating some of the changes that are happening in their landscape and to support certain use cases, certainly for things like mobile development, then they now have a new feature that they can use to, to make that super easy, again, without writing any code. So I'll, I'll summarize, and then we can do questions if anyone's got any questions. Um, so we just saw how Melinda logged in, used, designed an API and deployed it using low code, using tools like Data Weave to transform responses on the fly without having to write a whole bunch of JavaScript or Python um, in a tool that's specifically designed for integration. We saw then Bruce log in after Melinda deployed the implementation and secure it. So you can see that it's easy to automate those policies to make sure that there's a, they're consistently applied across NTO to mitigate risk. Then we logged in as Roxy. Roxy then looked at auto scaling APIs and she looked at Visualizer to determine performance bottlenecks or failing APIs uh, in order to help her get the root cause as fast as possible to fix it. And then we saw Jack. And Jack was the architect that if he's designing the APIs correctly and he's on board with the process of publishing the APIs and making them available across NTO, it makes his job easier in the future when he wants to swap out systems um, 
because it doesn't have to change. It's not a big project to change multiple APIs. It should just be one system API. So all I'll say is thank you. Thanks for listening. I've, ma I've made sure I've left 10 minutes at the end to, to answer any questions. And one thing I will do is just a plug for anyone who wants to get started. So anything I've covered today, um, I might just show you quickly. If you go to developer.mulesoft.com and go to tutorials, um, so anyone that's looking to do anything I've done today, there are tutorials to get you started for things like creating an API, uh, looking to use data weave. Um, if you're interested in things like um, deploying to Google Kubernetes or on AWS or on Azure, there are tutorials you can do to actually take you through that, including one for GraphQL. If you wanted to get hands on, there's a 30 day free trial that you can go and do exactly what I've done. Uh, make some mistakes. It's um, the best way to learn, I find. All right. So everyone post their questions in the chat now. Thanks for the feedback, Anne and Jan. Karen, I really appreciate it. Okay, we've got we've got a few coming in. Yeah, go, Janet. Just, just You can paste them all in one at a time or back to back, whatever you... So Karen did ask, where's the best fit for GraphQL with regard to API led? I would have thinks at the experience layer. Yeah, the way I think about it is it's not replacing the data connectors, Karen, to unlock the data from, from OMS in our instance or from SAP or from Salesforce. It's really as a replacement for experience and process APIs. I hope that answered your question. If it if I if I haven't answered it, please, please follow up. I'll I'll go on to Janet in the meantime. Um, thanks, Karen. Um, Janet's asking, can you show me how to add custom metrics to the API? So I think, um, Janet, what you're referring to there is how did we do the custom metrics in any point monitoring? Um, is that right? OK. Um, all right, well, let's open up any point studio. So going back to, to where we were before. Um, because the metrics are all modules in Exchange, I should just be able to search Exchange for the word metrics. And you can see here at the top, I've got any point monitoring custom metrics. Let's go ahead and add that to the NTO order. And you can see here it's added the module to my palette. And it's also added a dependency to my Java application on the left. So there's only one method available in this, in this connector, and that's send custom metric. So Melinda could have dragged that onto the get order flow. And all Melinda needs to do is give it a metric name, a dimension, and a fact. So the dimension might be revenue and the fact might be count. And every time it flows, she can do some calculations using, again, data weave if she needs to aggregate across the payload and send that to any point monitoring. And then it becomes available to add to my custom dashboard. Uh, let me know, Janet, if I didn't answer that very well, but I think that's what you're after. Um, the other question, this is focused on REST APIs. Does MuleSoft support event-driven applications? So yeah, I guess MuleSoft's point of view is HTTP REST services are an important part of doing an API-led architecture, but certainly not the be all and end all. Most people will be adopting um, applications like Amazon Kinesis or Apache Kafka. Um, but again, you can see here in my palette, I already have one for Apache Kafka. So MuleSoft does support topics and messages being posted to those topics because I can now create perhaps a, I can consume, if I drag that into my, into my canvas, I can now consume Kafka to card topics just by con configuring a connector, which is very similar to the Postgres connector specifying the topic I want to consume, 
and then start my flow from a message being published to that topic. Equally, I could publish back to Kafka um, if I wanted to publish to the event bus. Uh, and that applies to things like Salesforce as well. If anyone's using Salesforce, they have lots of methods, um, but certainly a lot of the, the new ones. So they'll have the ability to do push topics so I can push an event or I can subscribe to an event. I can do a subscribe channel listener, which will start my flow whenever Salesforce posts to a particular channel. So I think that answers that, Janet. Um, and then the last one, what regions are available if MuleSoft hosts an API? So, so I think that's referring to the fact that I'm deploying to Cloud Hub here, which is the MuleSoft hosted uh, runtime. Uh, what regions are available? So it's probably a question, is it, is it available in region? Um, the best resource I can point you to, Janet, is in the MuleSoft documentation. So again, docs.mulesoft.com gives you detailed information on any of the features we've covered today. Um, under, under the Mule runtime, thinking off the top of my head here, deploy Mule applications, deploy applications to Cloud Hub. If I scroll down here, I'm nearly 100% confident that Part of the deployments is going to be here. So these are the AWS regions that you can deploy to if you use Cloud Hub. So you know, Sydney would be supported, Tokyo, Singapore in, in APAC. Uh, Karen, API designer is US East hosted only. So can you give me a little bit more information on that, Karen? Are you is it a question between runtime plane versus control plane where API designer, or are you talking about flow? Thanks, Janet. Yeah, so good question. So. There's a difference between in MuleSoft terminology between the control plane and the runtime plane. The runtime plane is where your actual API implementations run. And that would be one of these locations if you're using Cloud Hub, or you can take that and put it on your own infrastructure um, or run it using Kubernetes on AWS, Google, or Azure. So you get to choose where if you do those and Cloud Hub it has to be one of these regions. That is slightly different to the control plane that manages metadata. So in order to, for instance, pull something down from the exchange, there needs to be a certain amount of metadata that's downloaded into the runtime. So from, the, from memory, they wouldn't be fully supported across all these regions. I'd have to go and find the documentation for you, Karen. But look up um, MuleSoft control plane, and it should give you the regions. Awesome. Well, I'm, we're nearly coming to the end, and I'm sure I'll, I, I don't know if I get cut off, but if I do, thanks everyone for listening. Again, you can reach out to me on LinkedIn anytime. Happy to connect. If there's any follow up questions, please let me know. Otherwise, I'll hang around for literally another 60 seconds, um, but have a great day, everyone. Appreciate you attending.